All right, good morning and good afternoon for some of you. Uh, my name is Adam Winterton and I am the Stone Security Global Technology Center Manager. Um, to start off with, this is a new format for us this year. Um, last year and in years past, we've had these lunch and learns in person at each of our Stone offices, but as Stone Security has grown, that's become more of a challenge to get people in the right place and keep, keep quality training and keep a high level of consistency between those. So we're trying this new format where we are going to do these here in Las Vegas at our Global Technology Center, and we are going to broadcast them and stream them out to our office locations. So for those of you at our office locations, welcome. Um, hopefully there's a, a sales resource or an engineering resource there that you can annoy and bug with your questions after and during. Um, for those of you who are joining us online, we will be allocating some time towards the end of the meeting to answer questions. And then if there's anything that we still don't get to, we will be covering those questions um, outside of the meeting and getting back to you as quick as we can. So, all right. Uh, for those of you who are physically at a Stone Security office, lunch is either already in front of you, hopefully, um, or on its way. They are scheduled to be around the noon hour um, at each of the local time zones. So for us here in Las Vegas, we'll be finishing out our day with lunch, but for the rest of you, you'll either have it now or you'll have it in about an hour. Um, for with this new format, any questions that do arise, the Teams meeting has a Q&A feature. And in that Q&A feature, you um, can post your questions and we will try to respond either uh, live as we go, or we will respond to those after the fact and, and get in touch with you over email or whatever we need to do. This session is also being recorded and will be made available to YouTube, um, as well as other means as we find it necessary. So looks like we have about 31 people joined the meeting currently, and uh, another handful or so at our various offices throughout the US. And with that, let's kind of roll into the next thing. Oh, one other thing I forgot. Following this, um, uh, this uh, security and sandwiches today, we will be sending out a survey. This survey is going to be asking for your feedback on how this went, on my training, on the, the new format, your thoughts and opinions, and we want you to be completely honest in those, even if it might hurt my feelings, go ahead. Um, we will be also, for those who submit a survey response, we'll be adding your name to a raffle, and we'll be raffling off a prize. Not quite yet sure what that prize is, but uh, Patrick will send out some communication about that to the meeting attendee list later today, um, or possibly tomorrow, depending on uh, how things go. All right, so today we're gonna get started and we are gonna jump right into Milestone. This is our beginning slash intermediate class and we're gonna cover, um, we're gonna start with some pretty basic um, topics. We're gonna go over live functionality, playback functionality, and then we're gonna start looking at views and view groups and how those are created. And then we're also gonna start looking into bookmarks and searches. So there's a lot to cover there. So we're going to steamroll through this, hopefully not too quick, but fast enough that we get to cover all of those exciting topics. OK. All right, so here on my screen, um, you should be able to see a Milestone smart client. This is one of the three smart clients, one of the three clients that Milestone X Protect has. Um, this is the thick client that gets installed on your desktop. It is the preferred option. It is the most capable and the most feature rich. There is also a web client, and there is also a mobile client, and each of those comes with a scaled back set of features. We'll go over those in future sessions, but for today, we're gonna be focusing on the smart client. And so with that, um, some of this may look a Adam, little can different. You share, can you share your screen? Oh, yep, sorry about that. Let me fix that. Screen share, and- There we go, perfect. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Patrick, for catching that. OK, so now you can see my screen. <laughs> All right. Um, this may look slightly different to some of you if you're already familiar with XProtect. About, it was 2023 R1, 
the layout changed slightly where you used to have a live and a playback tab up here in the top left corner across the top. Now that has been replaced with a single tab called views and the live and playback toggling now happens down across the bottom of the screen. Now, initially, my thought was that is really annoying. However, the more I've played with it and the more I've used the software in this new configuration, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to outline just really quick why. So when I go to playback, my timeline and all my controls, where I'm going to be spending most of my time with my mouse cursor is right down here at the bottom. So it was always a little bit of an extra movement, an extra mouse drag to get all the way back up to the top left corner to toggle between live and playback. So now while I'm down here, it's really easy. And you don't have to focus so much on hitting just playback or just live. You can hit live and it will toggle and you can hit playback and it will toggle. So it's basically one giant button and you can just toggle and, and click between them. So this, this started again in 2023 R1 and moving forward, this is where that button is. If you're still on the old version, then the functionality is still the same, but what you have is instead of a views tab across the top, you have a view, you have a live and a playback. All right, so in live, on the left-hand side of our pane, we have a navigation pane over here on the left hand side and we can expand this we can shrink it this gets us you know if, if it's we're not modifying your views we're not doing anything we can get that out of the way and save that space which makes our cameras fit the boxes a little bit better we also can have a we also have a full screen toggle full screen mode button over in the right hand corner and when we tap that now it takes it full screen and we can see that full screen to get out of full screen, if you just take your mouse and drag it and hold it kind of up against the top, you should have this bar that pops up. And then you have that toggle button there as well. You can also just hit escape. Of course, escape today isn't working for me. Um, I might have changed that shortcut. I will verify that that's what that is later. But you do have that button that pops up there. Um, I believe also like the F11, your typical full screen shortcut also works as well. All right, so within live, just as we go through a general functionality here, we have a three by three grid of cameras. Any camera that I double click on is going to go full screen. To get back out of full screen, I can just double click on it again. And I can do that to any camera in my system. OK, now one thing that you'll notice that again, that dropped your sharing. Oh. That was probably the full screen. There you go, perfect. Sorry about that. Toggling full screen probably uh, killed teams in, on the share. All right, so, okay. So to cover that again, so when you double click on a camera tile, it's gonna take that camera full screen and you can do that on any camera. Now you'll notice that I have a habit of double clicking anywhere in the black. You can also double click on the title bar up here across the top. It's kind of a smaller bar to grab. Um, generally, there's black on the sides of the image that you can grab that are a little bit easier. You can, if you want, double click in the camera view itself. It generally doesn't cause any issues, but there's one instance where it does cause a problem. And I'll show you what that is. If I have a camera that is a PTZ, and let me grab my PTZ here. OK, when I double click on my PTZ tile, my camera here to make that go full screen, watch what happens to my camera. It also interpreted that click as a move to this point, which could be undesirable. You might want it, you might not want it, right? Uh, but be aware that if you double click on a PTZ camera to make it go full screen, you might also be moving your camera in the process. This is why if you build that habit and double click in the black area surrounding the image, then you will have you won't have that issue. Um, all right, so let's move on. There's a series of buttons across the bottom here. We will cover those 
uh, in a little bit uh, later, but we're going to keep moving through the rest of the live and playback functionality first. You also have, um, well, let's do this. So any camera that I click and drag, I can zoom in. So I'm dragging a box, I'm zooming in, and I can zoom in to that area. So clicking to zoom in, click and drag, you get that nice box. And when you let go of it, the camera is going to try to fill that tile with what you have selected as much as possible. OK, when you want to zoom back out, you can mouse wheel back out. You can also mouse wheel in. Or if you're zoomed in, you do have some plus and minus buttons down in the bottom left hand corner. For those who need to be really efficient at their speed, these tend to not be a common usage. Most people are going to mouse wheel in and out because it's going to be a lot faster and a lot smoother for you. OK, on a PTZ camera, so we already covered the double click, so that kind of hinted to what, how I might control that camera. There's two options in Milestone. My preference is the click to center. So wherever I click, that camera is going to try to center on that location. This also gives me the click and drag where I can click and drag and I get my box and now it will zoom in to that point on the camera. So nice lovely set of stock GMC rims on this truck. We'll zoom back out. We'll hit our home location. I could also mouse wheel back out if I wanted to. Um, to kind of track an object with click to center, it's going to be a series of clicks. And so if there was a person walking through there, we could do that. If I kind of follow the UPS truck, we'll zoom in a little bit. Of course, he's going to make a stop here and quit driving for me. But there's also a person over here. So we can kind of move and navigate through our system like that. Now, when you click, there is that little bit of motion kind of stutter that happens. That may be good. That may be bad. Depends on your situation. There is another method of controlling a PTZ that will show you. When you go to your settings, here on the application tab, there is a option called default PTZ click mode. Now, for most of your systems, and Milestone has elected to use the virtual joystick as the default method. So this may be what comes up to you by default. If you want to change it, you can do that specific to your user. Once you're signed in, you can make this change and it will stick for you. OK, so here's what virtual joystick does. Instead of having a cursor that I can click and center, I now have an arrow key. And as I move my mouse around the screen, that arrow is kind of pointing in a different direction. So. And I also have, um, let me pull up to where it's a little more visible. I now have a cursor, a crosshair in the center of my, of my camera. OK, so as I move around that, you see that's changing. As I click and hold, my camera is going to move proportional to the distance it is from the center of that, that, from that crosshair, from the center of my view. OK, so we can move fast, we can move slow. The tricky part is, is that just how I overshot my stop point? If you're moving too quick, it can be really easy to overshoot. So some people prefer this method because it gets you a nice smoother pan and others prefer the click to center. Completely personal preference. There's no right or wrong answer to this. So I like the click to center, but that's just more typical to the way that I work and function on it. All right. Yes, yeah. So with the click to center, you do get that. You can click and drag the box and it will zoom to that point. When your virtual joystick, you, you don't have a click and drag, uh, click and drag and draw a box option. So what you're left with is you can move the camera with your cursor by clicking and holding, and then you can mouse wheel in to zoom in. And if you're really ambidextrous, you can do a combination of both mouse wheel in and move it at the same time. Or there is another option. Milestone supports any USB joystick. OK. So. If you have 
a you know a, a a flight joystick that you used when you were a kid because you like to play flight simulators and crash your planes because that's about all we ever were able to do. Um, then you can plug that in as long as it's USB and has current drivers for your operating system. Milestone will detect it and you can use it. I'll expand that a little bit. If you have an Xbox or PlayStation controller and you can connect that to your PC, depending on the version of the controller, you might need a wireless dongle to do so or it might do it natively. Then you can also utilize your Xbox or PlayStation controller to do that as well, wired or wireless. So there's, there's a lot of options and versatility in moving your cameras around. All right, let's not dwell on uh, PTZs too much more. Let's move on to some other exciting things. So we're gonna move over to our playback tab. And on our playback tab, the first thing you'll notice is not a lot changed. But here's what did change. We now have our controls at the bottom and we have a timeline. We actually have a timeline um, that goes from the left side of our screen to the full right side of our screen. And below that are two bars. You'll notice one of them is mostly gray with little segments of red. And the other one is all full red. I'll explain the differences to these. The top bar that we're seeing is showing me data relevant to the camera that I have selected, which is this PTZ with my blue box around it. If I want to change, I can click on another camera and you see that now my information on that bar updates. So as I click on different cameras, I can very quickly get a concept of where is my recorded video? Where is my motion? Okay, there is, um, the coloring means something as well. And the gray, so if we look at our lobby camera here, just one camera, we'll simplify it. One camera, the gray that we see here is very simply, there's no recorded data at that time on the timeline. And you can see I, I'm clicking and dragging my timeline and my timestamp right here in the center is changing and updating to that. There's no video at that point. If I go to the very end of my recordings, then I get an after recordings message. This is not necessarily an error saying something is going wrong or breaking with your system. This is simply just saying where you are at on your timeline, there is no video for this camera at that point. Same thing, if I go all the way to the beginning, okay, and let me hit the clear at the beginning one. Okay, you get the same message before recordings. All that's saying is where I'm at on my timeline, I am before any recordings exist for this camera. Because I can, I can actually take my timeline and I could go back years if I wanted to. But my camera isn't set to record that long, and so I don't have data there. So that's how they show us where we're at. Okay, so if I go back to my current. Um, the second, oh, well, let's, let's see here. So you'll notice that we do have a red and we have kind of a lighter shade of red or a, a lighter pink that might show, yep, a little, little bit of a lighter red. Um, the red is where Milestone detected there was motion within that scene. So right here, if I hit play, we'll notice that we have a person walking. There's was the motion start and we're walking through the scene and we can go all the way through. And there the motion ends just right there at the end where he disappears out of the scene. But what's that little bit before and after? That's a pre and a post buffer. And those values are configurable um, on a system wide and a little bit of a per camera basis. Those let us make sure that we are capturing just a little bit of data before the event and a little bit of data after the event. Because let's be honest, the way that we're determining if there's motion is not some intelligence saying, I see a person, let's record. It's purely, we have a collection of pixels in our image that are changing, and that change is happening above a certain threshold, okay? If, if you're looking really carefully, we'll zoom in really tight here, there are pixels changing all the time. And I don't know if that shows up very well on the stream, but we have 
minor changes in the pixels, even when there's nothing happening in that part of the scene. OK, so there's there's a lot of um, requirements that kind of say, hey, it's got to change enough. This pixel has to change colors and not just you know be within the same color gradient. This not only that one pixel, but maybe the 10 or 20 pixels surrounding it also have to change. So uh, we have controls that let us adjust the threshold based on we want to start recording over this much motion, then we can adjust that. And so if you have a camera that you're looking at it going, um, he doesn't, we don't start recording until he's like halfway in the scene or when he gets off over there in the distance, all of a sudden he just like disappears. Well, that's more than likely a symptom that we just need to tweak and adjust that threshold a little bit. Um, and that is something that is done in the uh, management client. So it's not something that most end users can get in and do. Uh, so that would be something your system administrator does or something that we are happy to help in, uh, to, happy to jump in and help with as well. All right, now let's talk about the bottom bar here. We have a bottom bar that in this camera view is mostly all full. What this is telling me, this is the cumulative of every camera that we're seeing inside my view. All nine of these cameras together cumulatively are saying we have recorded video. Which camera that is, we can kind of see my top, my number two camera position here has video. My number three position has video. And my uh, uh, seven and eight have video. Now, You'll notice that my let's look at this this one position. It's a little ghosted. It's a little gray. OK, that's because for it, we're in that gray part of the timeline where there's no video. So when you're looking through and you're seeing those kind of come live and then disappear and go back to gray again, that's all that's happening is that there's no recorded video at that point. And so we're showing the last recorded image kind of grayed out. So it's just telling you that there's no video happening at that spot. OK, we have um, our play forwards button so we can play forwards. We can watch this UPS truck back up. We can reverse it and play backwards. Now it'll appear as though he's pulling away, even though we're watching it backwards. He's really backing into it. This car we saw driving backwards. This person is driving, walking backwards. So we are indeed going backwards. OK, you'll see that my timeline is showing that timestamp as well. And that is referenced from this center line on my timeline as well. OK, we have a slew control button so we can kind of scrub the video. Um, let me let's do this so we can scrub forwards. We can scrub backwards. How much and how fast it goes is dependent on, again, how much I move that slider. Some people love this. Personally, I find it a little bit easier just to drag my timeline and move my timeline. Um, your timeline can show right now we're showing five minutes. That's five minutes is all the way from the left hand side all the way to the right hand side is five minutes. I can make that all the way as low as one minute. So now look how nice and easy it is to scrub that video. OK, I can also make that timeline as long as four weeks. OK, so I can see four weeks worth of data and you're seeing it start to populate here. It's filling in the data associated in that four weeks and it's it's going pretty quick. We're already back to January 18th and we can click and drag and you can see that that moves and, and jumps pretty quick. Now, if you want a shortcut on how to get that timeline zoomed in and out, if you like to use the mouse and keyboard, um, hold down the control key and you can mouse wheel. If I just mouse wheel over the timeline by itself without any keyboard, it's going to scroll it. But if I hold down the control key and mouse wheel, my timeline is now going to zoom in and zoom out. So you don't have to jump over here and try and get the little button and click it a whole bunch of times. You can mouse wheel in and out. OK. All right, so. Let's jump up to some of the buttons now. We talked about play forwards. When we have that play forward option, it turns into a pause button. So now I can pause it. We do the same thing on the play backwards. It turns into a pause button so I can pause it. I can toggle that back and forth without having to move my mouse. 
to the sides of that, let me grab a better camera for this. Let's come back here to where we had somebody walking through. All right, we'll do the truck driving through. Okay, so just to the outsides of my play buttons, I have a frame by frame button. So if we wanted to look, look at something in really slow granular motion, I can click, next frame. I can click again, next frame. I can click again, next frame. And I can just keep clicking forwards and backwards. We have both of those buttons. Okay, let me grab now an interior camera. Let's jump to the, we'll do this one. Okay, so outside of my frame buttons, we have a sequence button. Previous sequence on the left-hand side and next sequence on the right-hand side. The sequence buttons jump from one sequence to the next and you're thinking, well, that doesn't explain much. A sequence is a block of video with a start and an end, meaning that there's going to be a break between the next sequence. And you can kind of treat these maybe like chapter buttons on a, you know, a CD player if we're old enough to know what those are. Um, I can jump from sequence to sequence. And you can see, watch my timeline as I do this. So as I click that button, it's going to move from the kind of medium-sized block I'm on now to the small block preceding it, to the next small block. And so this lets me just quickly jump through these sequences. And we can do the same thing going forward. But there is a caveat. If you have a camera that's recording continuously, you don't necessarily have sequences to jump between. Because remember, we defined it as a block of video that has a start and a stop with a break before and after. So my exterior camera, this the one we're looking at here, is recording continuously. And if I do my next sequence, it just takes me to right now. If I go backwards to my previous sequence, it takes me clear back to January or sorry, December 28th. Um, you know, maybe the camera rebooted or maybe I upgraded the firmware or there was something at that point that caused the camera to drop offline for looks like about 30 seconds. So there are breaks even on recorded video, but it's not going to work the way that you're expecting or would be used to if you're doing motion based recording. And then on the far outside of our uh, button controls here, we have a play a first sequence and a last sequence. So if you pull up a camera and you're just like, I just want to check really quick how far back this camera goes. I can click first sequence. This camera goes all the way back to October 27th, 2023 at 1040.19. And all the way back to now on 125, 2024 at 1023 a.m. So we get the full coverage there. If it's a really quick way to check, hey, I just need to check how far back this one camera goes. Uh, maybe you have an incident that you're still investigating. You're not ready yet to export that video, but you want to see how close you're getting to the end of your retention, how much time maybe you have left to to finish what you're you know trying to grab and export before it starts disappearing. Um, this would be a good time to mention that your milestone system is programmed with a defined retention period. Typical would be 30 days. Common would be 45, 60, 90 days. Those are other common scenarios, but that's, that's customer driven. So that's driven by your organizations that say, we wanna keep our video for 90 days. We wanna keep our video for a year. We have a customer that keeps their video for seven years. So the capability is there. It depends on if you have enough storage. Um, and if you don't have enough storage, there's some technologies that we can leverage to extend your storage into the cloud in a hybrid solution. If you're interested in that, come talk to us. We'll share with you about Tiger Technologies. Um, so if your video is set for 30 days, we'll use a common scenario. When your video is now 30 and a half days old or 30 days and an hour old or 31 days old, it's being actively removed from the system. This is not typically set up to where we're just going to fill the hard drive and whatever we get, we get. That actually can cause issues in storage performance. 
So we try to avoid that scenario. But 30 days, just know if you're at 29 days, that video is going to disappear tomorrow. So you need to either export it and get it out of your system, or you would want to use, if you're on corporate, Milestone X Protect corporate, you, would, you could leverage a feature called evidence lock. Evidence lock is simply going to say, for this block of video, from this time to this time on these cameras, I want to override and ignore my typical retention profile. And, you need, and then you could say, I want to keep this for an additional week, an additional month, or an additional year. Now, when you evidence lock video, it locks it in place so that it cannot be moved. So if you are doing this on a regular basis and you just have hours and hours of hours of video in an evidence lock, that is storage that you are occupying, which would normally otherwise be used or could potentially be used by your normal recordings. So if you're a heavy evidence lock user, just be aware that it's being kept in the same place that your regular video is being kept. And therefore, if you get too much, your 30 day retention is going to start turning into 28 days, 27 days, 26 days, because it's going to prioritize keeping what's in your evidence lock because you told it to. And then it's also going to prioritize your newest video first because it's the most important right now. What's 30 days old or 27, 28 days old is less important than what we have coming in right now. All right. That is a real quick overview to live and the playback functionalities. Let's look now at how we create this view that we're looking at. So we have this navigation pane that we talked about over here on the left hand side. I'm going to expand it. Right now, as you see, we have a list of views. We have below that a section called cameras, and we have below that a section called audio, if the camera has audio. We also have a section called MIPS plugins. Um, this is if you have other integrations with your system, you might have some controls for those integrations here in this section. Um, generally, uh, there's not going to be much in there, but um, OK, so I can from my camera section. So I have here at the top level, my root level of my camera section, Global Technology Center. I can click the little arrow and expand that out. Or if you want to be a little bit quicker, double click it. And then you don't have to hunt and try and grab that little arrow. I can now double click on cam all cameras. The way I have this organized is all of my cameras, literally every one, is in the all cameras group. But if you have a thousand cameras, that's going to be a really long list. Maybe you don't want to do that. You might go through and have other structures. So here I have a structure for camera manufacturers. Here's my Axis cameras. Here's my Hanwha cameras. Um, I have some system groups. Here's some cameras that are being con recorded continuously in a hybrid approach that we call continuous keyframe with motion. This is where instead of literally recording 15 frames per second continuously 24 seven, we're only doing that 15 frames or 30 frames or whatever. You know, we're only doing that during the motion events. But rather than not have anything when there's no motion, we're filling that in with a one or two frames per second um, keyframe. So we're keeping the keyframes as they come into the video. And then when we have motion, we're keeping all the frames as they come in and are recorded. So that's how we're able to do that. It comes with a little bit of an impact to storage but not, a, not near as much. It's about a 20% increase to storage doing keyframe with motion as opposed to doing just continuous constant 15 frames per second recording. So there's a big savings there. Plus then you get the little bit of backfill. That's what we're doing on our exterior cameras, which is why you see the light red saying that there's recorded video there, but no motion detected. And we'll get more into depth on that in a future discussion as well. Um, or we can cover that outside of this um, this session. OK, so in my camera navigation, I can click and drag any camera out to a tile. OK, and we'll do this in live. So any camera that I bring out is like, hey, we can pull these cameras out and we can see whatever that camera is in that tile that we drop in that tile. I can also rearrange the cameras inside of my view and I can click and drag that. 
and drop it on another tile. Now I'll show that again, because that may have been a little quick. What I'm clicking and dragging is this bottom pop-up bar. Click it, drag it, and you can swap place with whatever you're doing. Now, what I have just done is an uncommitted, unsaved change because I am not in setup mode. So as soon as I change away from that view and come back to and go back to it, all those changes are irrelevant. I didn't save it. So when you're using a view and you are just normal operations, looking at cameras and you're like, this has everything I need to see, but then this guy goes over to this other area and I need to pull in that camera. You can do that and it won't affect anybody else. That's only for what you're seeing on your workstation, okay? Now, if you find that you're doing that a lot to the point where it would just be better to build a new view, then what you want to do is you want to go into setup mode. So watch what happens when I click the setup button. The button itself is going to change, and then we're going to get some other colors and context in our in our screen as well. So it changed to this kind of orangish color. And you'll see that same orange color on the left hand navigation pane as well. This is telling me that I am in setup mode. Any changes that I now make will now be committed, and anybody else using that view it will also update their view as well, okay? So when you are creating views or modifying existing views, when in setup, just know that if others use that view, you're changing it for them also, with one exception. Let's come back up here to our, nav our, our views structure. If I minimize everything, we have a folder called demo views. We have a folder called internal, a folder called neighbor access, a folder called private, and then a folder called, called smart wall. What you see will vary and be different. These are permission based. Okay, I'm logged in as an administrator, so I get to see all of these in my list. If I were to log in as a demo user, somebody that belongs to the role of demo users, all they're going to see is this folder called demo views and private. Every user has their own private folder. Now, this doesn't mean that any cameras that you put in there are private to you and no one else can see them. What this means is that it is a place for you to put your own custom workflows, your own views that just you use. If I create something in demo views, anybody with access to demo views will see it. Okay. So just be aware of those differences because it's Adam, change. we had a question come in on um are administrators the only ones that can change this view? Is that correct? Um not entirely. Administrators can modify views and users can modify views if they're in a role that has permissions to do that. So that is customizable. And it's even customizable to the point where I can say, um, Adam gets to modify what is in demo, and Andy gets to modify what is in internal. Those are both shared groups, but we can't do vice versa. I can view what's in internal if that's what my permission says, but I can't modify it. But Andy could modify it and, and other way around. So there's customization that's there. So as a system administrator, if you have a collection of views that you don't want other people modifying, but you want to share it with them. I did this at a university because we were we were adding in cameras and the university's police department didn't wasn't aware of all the cameras that we were continually adding. You know, we were, we were anywhere between 30 and 50 a month. We were just adding cameras. And so that was a lot of cameras for them to keep on top of in terms of where are they all going? So I built views that included those new cameras and they had a standard set of views that they referenced. I made I maintain them as as an administrator and they only had view permissions to it, so they could not modify it. 
So that's that's one function there. But yes, to answer your question, it's it's customizable based on how we build the roles and the permissions. OK. Um, so let's I'm going to build. Let's build a new view in my demo views. Um, I like to just as a practice have a collection of blank views. Because what this does, I'll get out of setup mode. Let's say you're sitting down to investigate an incident and you're kind of starting from scratch. You can leverage your existing views if you want, but it also might be easier and faster uh, just to start pulling cameras out to a blank view. So on my blank view, I can just start pulling cameras out. Let's do the conference room. Let's do the rear PTZ, a really random connection of collection of cameras. Something really odd must have happened. But we can do that. OK, so I like to have that just a blank views group folder with a collection of blank views inside of it. OK, so let me get back into setup mode. So here in setup mode, let's come to we're going to create a new folder. So in my demo views, I'm going to create a new group and I will show that again because it's kind of quick. I have two options in doing this. I can right click. I love the right click contexts. I can right click and I have the options that are available. I can create a new group. OK, or down here across the bottom, we have the same buttons. New group. I can't create a new view in my root level. I have to go one level deeper and we'll show that. So right now I don't have a new view option. I do have a new group option. So we're going to call this. Um, we'll call this. LNL views. OK. Now, if I right click on that folder, now I do have the option to create a new view, new group. I can do a new subgroup if I want. So if you wanted to, you could nestle in structure views such as you have a large campus with multiple buildings. Here's a folder for my you know, building A, my admin building. Here's a folder for my HR building. Here's a folder for my IT building. And so you can group and structure it that way. And then you might say inside my admin building, I have my finance department, I have my C-suites, and you could do additional view, you know, folders there. So you can structure this in whatever way works best for your organization and for your workflow. All right, so let's actually create the new view. On my new view, I get a new pop-up menu, and then I continue to get additional pop-up menus. For now, I'm going to say, don't worry about the difference between the 4 by 3 and the 16 by 9. What we're looking at is the number of tiles that end up in that new view. The portrait ones, the 4 by 3 portrait and the 16 by 9 portrait, that's for if you have a monitor that's standing tall in portrait mode. Some people love it. Some people don't. There are a few views that are custom that, that, that are specifically included for that orientation. But there's no rule that says you have to use this or have to use that. You can pick whichever one suits your need. So in my four by three, I have this long list of random seemingly numbers. A one by one is telling me that there's one camera by one camera, and I literally have one camera. I also have, as you can kind of see, this little icon representation of what that view looks like, and it just has the number one in it. So that's one view. If I come down a little bit um, towards the bottom, we have a three by three with the number nine in the rectangle. That's telling me that there's nine in there, or I can do the simple math, three times three is nine. What this is telling me is that there are three and three, three cameras by three cameras. So. Let's do a, uh, so let's do, let's do a two by two. So here I have two cameras across and two cameras down, which gives me a total of four cameras. So it created this new view inside that folder that I had selected. We can give it a name. We will call it sample new view. You just type. If you forget and you start to drag cameras out or you decide to change the name, 
you can right click on it and you have a rename option and we'll call it um, different views now. OK, now when I right click on a view, my options are rename, delete or copy. You can if you want and to showcase this, let's grab my map view. I'm going to right click on my map view and I'm going to copy that. I like that view and I'm going to put it in my own folder or wherever you want to put it. OK, or maybe it needs to be replicated across different folders. So now I can right click on my folder and I can paste it. So I was able to duplicate that, copy paste it from one location to another. Very easy. And there's my map. OK. So we'll cover maps in a future session as well. So make sure to come back for that one because they are a lot of fun and very helpful. All right, so let's say we have our view. Um, I'm only looking for four cameras. That's why I picked the two by two because it just gives me the four cameras. And we're going to scroll down to where it says system overview. Now you might be looking at this going, where the heck are my cameras? They can be kind of hidden depending on how your system is named. My system is named the Global Technology Center. Your system might be named um, or just have been left defaulted to the name of your milestone server, um, or it might be something else. So just be aware if you're looking for it and you can't find it, um, it has the little world and like little server computer icon there. Okay, I can double click on it or click the arrow to expand it out. And now we see that same list and that same structure by all cameras, manufacturers, and system groups. So I'm going to go to all cameras. And let's start pulling in some cameras from our lounge. So let's grab our little kitchen nook. That's useful. What else is over there in that area? Let's grab our podcast corner. OK, I like that one. Our southeast corner, and that, that's a good one. And let's grab the snack bar. OK, no, I don't love the snack bar. There's a little X that shows up in the corner of that tile. I can click that to clear that camera out of that view. Um, alternatively, I could just drop another camera on top of it, and it replaces it. OK, I like that view. I feel like that's going to give me what I want. I want to save it. If I'm all done editing views, I don't want to build anymore. I can just click the setup button and jump out. And now I'm in the live with my new view. I can change to a different view. Here's my smart map. I can come back to my view called different views. And here it is. Now that I know what's in there, we're going to rename it. We're going to go to setup mode because this is a committed change. We're going to rename it. We're going to call it lounge. All right. So anybody with access now, any user with the role permissions to view or edit the demo views group can now see that view. It's there. They can use it. It'll show up update live in their list. OK, let's do another one. So let's do lunch and uh, LNL views and I'm going to go to new view. Let's uh, let's do six. Let's find one with six views. I know that. You know, the instant I'm looking at, it's going to need a few more cameras. Let's do six. Um, all right, six, six. Here's a four. Four by one is four. Uh, that's going to be five. One plus five is six. OK, I could do this. Here's a one plus five. Um, option one. OK, maybe not the layout I want. Maybe it's perfect. Let's do another one. Let's find another option here. New view, four by three. And let's look at, OK, we have a two by three. Two times three is six. All right. It's kind of some longer, skinnier boxes. Might work. There's probably another option, though. We'll call that option two. Let's do another one. And this is where it's going to kind of click that don't worry about the four by three, 16 by nine. Look for the right size and shape of, of the, the tiles and the quantity, OK? There is another before we had a two by three. That's two across three down. I want the three by two version of that. So. Strangely enough, it's in the 16 by nine. So three by two. Oh, that looks a lot better. We'll call that option three. Of course, I clicked out of it, so now I need to right click and rename. Hit enter. OK, there we go. So we have our three views. This has six and this has six. Let's start dropping some cameras into it and see what we get. Now, one thing that I will show you that's kind of helpful. 
Um, if we grab a group, a folder, I can say, take all of my Hanwha cameras and I can pull them out and let go. And it's going to fill every empty tile. Now, I only have six empty tiles here and I have more than six Hanwha cameras. So which ones did it grab? Well, it just grabbed the first six. And so cameras seven, eight, nine, and 10 in there didn't, didn't get pulled into a view. But it is helpful to know that that is an option. Um, all right, let's grab that same grouping of cameras and let's put it in our option three. Hanwha, drag it over, there we go. And I'm gonna jump out of setup and I'm gonna minimize my sidebar. So now I have this view. And you notice how each camera kind of nicely fills the tile. So I've got my three across and two down. I don't have a lot of black space, which makes my cameras fill and just look really nice. That's the three by two option that was in the 16 by nine folder. Let's look at the other six tile option. Here we go. Same cameras, same aspect ratio, same resolution. What changed was the orientation. Now I have two across and three down where before I had three across and two down. I've got a lot of black space. My screen size didn't change, but now my cameras are all a lot smaller. So when you're laying out your views and you're running into this, just know that there might be a better option that maybe you looked over or is in one of the other, other groups, other menu options, okay? Um, because this, this is not a great layout for this view. All right, now a question that comes up really commonly. I made a view, I saved it, it's done, it's been working great, but we just added another camera. Can I just click and drag and make this, turn? can I turn this six view into a seven, eight, or a nine view? The answer is no. Um, Milestones views are not yet dynamic. That's been on the feature request list for a long time, and we hope that they're getting to that point soon. But what you have to do now is kind of start from scratch and build it over. And I'll show you some tricks on how to make that a little bit easier. Um, you can, let's start by creating a new view. So we have a six and we wanna create a nine. So I'm gonna go a four by three because I know that's where my three by three nine is. There it is. Oops, let's give it a name. I clicked out of it, bad habits. Okay, we're gonna call this um, new option. Well, well, we'll just call this expanded option. Uh, it was three. Okay, expanded option three. So, I'm going to take my option three and I'm going to get out of my setup mode. I'm going to right click on my option three and I'm going to hit send view to new floating window. All right, there it is. It's, it's, it's in its own window. We can get rid of that guy. Pull that back up. It minimized them both. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one of these to one side of my screen and the other one to the other side of my screen. You could just click and drag each of the cameras out individually from the menu structure like we've already done. If they're kind of from all over the place, like if you have a view that is, these are my exterior entrances and they're from all over your system, that might take a little bit of time. I'm gonna jump into setup mode and I'm gonna click and drag this camera to this tile. And I can simply take my existing cameras. I don't have to go and hunt for them but I can pull them over, okay? There's the six that I had existing. I'm gonna get rid of this one because I don't need that anymore. Make this back full screen. Oops, wrong screen. Pull that back over. There we go, okay. And now I can start to add in the rest of my views. So let me come here. Let's pull out the rest of our Hanwha cameras. So we'll grab, let's see, we'll grab this one and this one, and this one, and there we go. Let's pull, there we go, all right. So it's an easy way, or an easier way, I'll say, to kind of recreate an existing view and expand it to additional tiles. And 
maybe one day we'll get to the point where we can just start dragging cameras out and it'll dynamically adjust how those are laid out. We'll see. But for now, that's the method. Hey, if I am done, I can get out of setup mode. I can keep going. We're going to keep going because there's some other things I want to we want to look at. Um, let's come to we created this. Um, it was a five view. And we get the one big tile and then four smaller tiles. And there's a couple different versions of this as well. So we have a, a one plus one plus two, which is going to be one big corner tile, one long skinny one across the bottom, and then two normal size on the sides. Um, it's nice that we have this little graphical layout of what it's going to look like before we go and create it. But the more you do this and the more you're in it, the more you'll just kind of know, oh, I, I know exactly what those numbers mean. Um, let's grab a two plus 10. This is a really common view that I see out in the field a lot. And a lot of people are like, there are two cameras that I want to see more prevalent than anything else. Maybe it's my front entry and the lobby, and then we'll just do hallways and other entrances and exits across the bottom. So we can lay it out that way. So if I come to all cameras and I know that my exterior, let's see my, uh, we'll do, let's do this one. So here's my vestibule front entry. Mm, I could do that one. I want the intercom one. There we go. Okay. And now I want my exterior warehouse receiving door. There we go. And then across the bottom, we can start throwing in some other cameras. Let's pull in some additional warehouse cameras. Okay, and then we'll pull in some lobby cameras. And just like that, we build out a nice, pretty view. Okay. Now there's some other things that we can drop into our view. Let's kind of go through what those are. I'm going to clear out these two top ones. There is, if I scroll back down to where we have our cam, our system overview, if I minimize my all cameras, my camera lists here, below this, we see some other options. Access monitor is if you have your access control system integrated into your milestone system. And we'll cover this in depth in another session this year. But just to show you what that is, we're going to grab a door. And let's pick our, uh, not that one. Let's pick a door that actually gets used more often, front door. OK, and I'm going to hit OK. When I get out of my setup mode, I now have this running list of door events. We had some door forced opens because I dogged the door open this morning. So every time it opens, it's going to be a door forced. Um, here's Andy coming in this morning. Here's me coming in this morning. And this is tying and pairing your access control information to your video information. So there's no more having to look at one screen. OK, this door was propped open at this time. All right, where's that camera? And trying to find those and match those up. Bam, it's done. It's that easy, that quick. OK, we'll go into that in more depth in the future as well. So we also have things that we can pull over. We have alarms. We have the alarm list and the alarm preview. If you guys use alarms, these might be useful to drop into some custom views. You can pull over a carousel. Carousel is kind of what it sounds like. Here's my cameras that I want. We're going to grab you and you. We'll just grab a collection of cameras here. Pick ones that are important to you. And we're going to make the default carousel time for four seconds. And let's make this second camera here. I want it to last a little bit longer. We'll make it uh, eight seconds. As I hit OK. Now we have a carousel. Carousels are only usable in live mode, though. Just be aware. So here's get out of setup. Here's our carousel. OK, by itself, it's going to start rotating through these cameras. There was four seconds. This one should be eight seconds. Here's the next one. And it's going to go through that by itself. This is a really good way of kind of rotating through a lot of cameras without making them really tiny on, on a bunch of on a bunch of screens. OK, you can you can pause your carousel. Now it's going to stay there until I resume it. I can I thought I saw something in that last one. I can go backwards and check it. 
No, I didn't see anything. I can hit play and just and it'll continue ro rotating through that carousel. OK, all right. Um, if I go to playback, though, watch what happens. Playback. No. It's not usable in playback. There's so there's no information to show there. So in playback, that becomes a wasted tile. All right, let's go back to live. Let's go back to setup. Let's get rid of our carousel and let's move on to the next one. Hotspot. And while I'm at it, I'm going to pull out the HTML page. Um, HTTPS colon slash slash stone security.net. I'm going to hit OK. And let's get out of setup mode. OK. Carousel. Or sorry, a hotspot. A hotspot is going to highlight whichever camera you have selected. So whatever camera has that blue box around it is going to come big now on my larger tile. So let's grab our stone logo here. There it is. Let's grab uh, our warehouse roll up door. There it is. OK, the HTML page gives you just that. It's a web page in your camera tile. I can even click it to make it go full screen. And here is the stone security web page. OK, now. A caution. Don't try to watch Netflix in it. <laughs> It doesn't work <laughs> and uh, there you wouldn't get audio out of it anyway, so it, it would be pointless. Um, it's intended for if you have a dashboard showing system statuses, alerts, alarms, who's on duty, um, a call list, any number of things like that that you're already leveraging, you can pull it in here and make it part of your single pane of glass. OK, that's its function. Um, all right, let's keep going down the list image. I can pull in images if I wanted to. I could just pull in a static blueprint of my floor, of my layout. Um, I could pull in a call tree if I had an image, or you could pull in a custom logo. Any number of things, any JPEG, any PNG, you can pull in as an image. Um, LPR, if you're using license plate recognition, we can pull LPR in. It's going to look pretty similar to the... Um, to the access control elements. Well, that one doesn't have any reads on it. So you're only going to see in your list here reads that happen once you've opened that view. OK. All right. Um, and we'll cover LPR. That's a fun one, too. We'll cover that later. Maps, I can pull out my map, my basic map, so I can specify which one. I can pull out my smart map. OK, and let's get out of setup. Let's go to our home location of the GTC and let's zoom this guy out. So we have our maps that we can leverage and we can pull those in to our views. It's just an item that goes in a tile. OK, let's keep going down the list. We'll cover maps in depth in the future. Uh, Matrix. Matrix is kind of an element similar to SmartWall, um, but it has some limited functionality. Um, it's not very commonly used, but basically the context of matrix is I'm going to put this in this tile. Now from my system, I can dynamically drive different cameras to that tile. OK, smart wall is that, but way more functional and way more capable. Um, we're now driving as many number of cameras we want and not just to that tile but to the whole layout we can change the layout we can do presets um, we will be doing an a really awesome smart wall demonstration this year as well um, as we continue to build out some of our technology here we'll be able to really show the case of that in a in a fun way um, okay let's see smart map smart wall and text if you you can pull out a text and we'll just say put text here and we can hit save and lo and behold, we have just some text in a box. <laughs> if you use that, I'd love to know what you're using it for. All right, that is. The bulk of creating views, but I want to show you something really fun now. So I'm going to pull this camera up here. There are still yet other items that we can pull into our views. If you keep coming down, we have this section called overlay buttons, and I just minimized it. 
overlay buttons right here. OK, and we have some different categories. Application. If you are utilizing microphones and speakers, we can pull a button out to it here that says talk to speakers. And then I can associate which speakers that button talks to. So if I'm looking at this camera and if I had speakers in my warehouse, I could hit the hold down the button and I could talk to my microphone on my laptop and it would play out the speakers in the warehouse. OK. We also have camera options. Clear all indicators on the selected cameras, clear all indicators on all cameras, uh, clear motion indicator on all cameras in the site. So let me show you what those indicators are that it's showing really quick. They're kind of hard to see on my high resolution screen, but up here in the top corner, the top right corner of each tile, you have a little, uh, let me let me do this. There we go. Well, that might have broken my screen share. Let's see. Let me zoom that back out and OK. So if this is still viewable on the screen share, um, if not, we'll fix it. We can but, see you. You're good. Okay, perfect. You can see I have my little green camera icon. This icon changes depending on what's happening. OK, um, that icon changes to red if it's recording. Green, if it's just live only, let me pull one of my exterior cameras in and we'll see recording. So you see that there, little recording. And you see that it just popped up with a little red man with like motion lines dragging behind him. That's telling me that there's motion that happened in that camera. Now, if I click on that camera, that indicator goes away. If I go to another camera and that motion happens again, hard drives through, person walks through, that indicator is going to pop up again. What that's telling you is that something happened in that scene since I last interacted with that that specific tile. OK, um, that indicator will also turn into a gray circle, um, indicating that the camera's offline for some reason. Um, you could also see, let's see, so a green camera, red circle, a gray circle. You could also see, I believe it's a little um, uh, a dark gray camera icon kind of with a slash through it. Um, so there's some different indicators that that you can see just on the status of your cameras. And that's what those are. So let's go back into setup. Um, we can also start recording. I can pull out a button that says record. OK. I can pull out a button that says stop recording so I can have a start and a stop. OK, so this would be like a manual control of, hey, um, nothing's happening. Or um, for example, if you want to ensure manual control, um, we did this in a testing center. So the testing center uh, would issue the person say, OK, per, you get to take your test at this desk. There's a camera at that desk. Well, they don't want to record just based on motion and they don't want to record continuously, right? Both neither of those are great situations for a testing center situation. Um, so we gave them button for start and a button for stop. And so when they check the person in, they click start. When they check the person out, they click stop. And now we have that person getting to their desk, sitting and taking their test in full duration. And we're not relying on, well, did they move enough to trigger a motion? You know, because they're quietly like turning their hand over and reading answers off their wrist or something, right? Um, so that's that's a that, that's a uh, function there. Um, toggle, we can also, there's a button to toggle it. So instead of a start, stop, separate buttons, you can just do one button that toggles. Okay, let's look down. We can add some PTZ buttons there. Um, these aren't really commonly used, but you could, uh, if you wanted to set up custom buttons to move the camera, to go to a specific preset or something. Um, the preset ones would appear here under the device where you're saying, here's my presets, and then you select the camera. Okay, events, um, you can create custom events inside a milestone. This, this would be more on the administrator side, creating these events and then making them available to you through your permissions. But for example, you could have a focus button that you drag, drop out there. Um, most cameras should need to be focused, but if needed, here's one. Um, so my PTZ golf sim, let me see if this is still working. If I click this, nope, I must have disabled that rule. OK, um, so I can have a button that says, hey, move this camera to this preset location. Now that one was the event that was based on the rule. I could if I wanted to. PTZ presets and we could take that camera 
And here's the golfer. And let me grab that camera so we can actually see what's happening to it as well. And that is my showroom, uh, PTZ 6315. Okay. And here we go. Click it. That camera now moves to its preset location. Okay. There's other methods though for that. And on a PTZ camera, you have a new button that shows up here. That is also your PTZ presets. So here's my lobby. Here's my IDF door. Here's we'll go back to the golfer. And if you have permissions to do this, you can also manage your PTZ presets and adjust them if needed or create new ones or whatever. OK. All right, let's release that one and it will go back home. OK, let's go back to the rest of our overlay button. So let's get rid of the golfer. Let's come down. OK, I can. If I have outputs tied to my system, I can trigger those outputs. And I'll show you one that I like to use. So this is this is integrated with my access control system. So I have outputs events in my access control system. If you just had a network IO, you could also do this just as a network output as a, as a low voltage contact closure. But I'm going to grab my warehouse roll up door and I'm going to do an open and I'm going to drop it up here. So if you have somebody sitting at a desk, lobby, receptionist area, and they need the ability to open a door easily, you can click that button. And for those of you who are here, you can hear it and we can see it. That door is opening. We've got some disbelief in the room here. <laughs> so I use this a lot because when I'm sitting at my desk in my office and UPS pulls up, well, I have my smart client open and I'm always watching. I've always got the cameras at least accessible there. So I can click the button and then start to walk over to the door and He's not sitting there ringing it a dozen times thinking I'm not coming, right? Or he's not getting in his truck to pull away and I have to start to chase him down. No, I'm here. It's, it's so easy. Click a button, I can close it again. Okay. This is also handy. I have locked myself out of the office before. My phone on my desk, my keys on my desk. Ah, oh, man. Or sorry, I had my phone, but my keys are on my desk, so I couldn't fob in to the building. Pull out my phone, and I have that same. Uh, 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 that same functionality on my phone, tap the button, boop, and I let myself into the building. <laughs> so you learn. Now my keys are always in my pocket. OK, um, so those are overlay buttons and a good overview of kind of some of the things that you can do uh, with your overlay buttons. Um, let's see. What else do we want to cover? Views, view groups, creating views. All right. I want to show you really quick. I just want to show you where those view groups that we were talking about, where those are created, OK? Um, and for just to clarify, when we're talking about this, we're talking about the top level groups here, OK? And this is this is going to be a really high level overview, but it's just for your awareness. In my management client, I have a section called view groups. Look familiar, demo views, internal neighbor access. Now, what's missing in there is private. I can't control or take away the private. That's there. But the, the rest of them, I can create new ones. So let's add a view group. We'll call this uh, custom new, custom new group. OK, and it's there. Now if I come over here, there it is, voila. I didn't have to log out. I didn't have to refresh. Milestone has made it quite nice that those view groups um, pop up and update live. Now. It would all it only shows up to me right now because I'm an administrator. Administrators have full access. OK, my demo user would not see that yet, but. I can give my demo user access to that, so roles. 
demo users. And in my permissions, there's a section called view groups. So here's the list of view groups that are created. And I can come to custom new group. That's the one that we made. And here's what I can allow. Read access. Can you see that it exists? Operate. Can you use it? Edit. Can you hit the setup mode and edit it? And then delete is, can you delete that group, which is more on the administrator side? Okay. Or could you delete views out of that group? Okay. So that is how those groups are structured. And then the camera devices that we were looking at. So this list down here of the all cameras, manufacturers, system groups, that these are called device groups. And they're up here in my devices, cameras. Each type of device has its own structure. Um, I like to personally build them similar to each other, if not the same. But here's my all cameras, cami manufacturers, system groups. If I wanted to, I could do a new one, add device group, locations. We're going to create a section on locations. We're going to do a subgroup here, add device group. We're going to call this showroom. I'm going to create another device group called lounge. And we can do another one called lobby and another one called warehouse. Oops, there we go. OK, and now I can through the management client, I can add cameras to there. What that looks like is just edit device group members. And we're going to say my, let's see, we're doing the lobby one. Nope, hold on. Let's come back. Lobby, edit device group members, all cameras, and lobby, because I've named them in a way that uh, keeps this list somewhat organized. I can just select lobby, add them all over there, and there they are, lobby. Okay, so. You save those changes and minimize that program. OK, now you'll notice that that new group hasn't showed up there yet. So that doesn't re, uh, update live. But what I recommend people doing, and this, every, this would be a really good thing to take a note on. If you go to, let me jump back, up in the top right corner, you've got your little three dots to expand the menu. Settings and more. I'm going to go to settings. From there, I'm going to go to keyboard. OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a shortcut that refreshes the configuration of what our smart client is using to pull the latest configuration from the management client. This is a really good uh, I, like seriously, everybody should do this. It should. I wish Milestone would just do it by default, and, and we've mentioned that to him. OK, shortcut key. And again, so you, this is the same process for creating any shortcuts. If you have shortcuts that you prefer that are different from the standards, you can create and modify your own. So I want the F5 key to be my refresh. F5 is standard refresh across most Windows uh, programs. So I'm going to do that. OK, then the category. I want this to come out of the application category because we're going to refresh the application and then reload server configuration. And I'm going to hit assign. There it is. And I'm going to hit close. Now, without that shortcut for that new group to show up, I have to log out and log back in. Nothing wrong with that, but why? Right? It takes a little extra time. Um, so I'm going to hit F5. Refresh, done, that quick, that easy. That's literally like, it's, it's so fast. That's going to save you a ton of time as far as shortcuts go. Now, if I go my cameras, look, here's my locations now. We created lobbies. Ah, this was good. You'll notice how there's only lobby. I don't have the warehouse. I don't have the lounge, and I don't have the showroom. That's because those groups are empty. Empty groups will show in the management client, but they will not be visible to the users in the smart client. I'm even logged in as an administrator into the smart client, and I still can't see it there. All right, so here's those cameras. And now look, I can click and drag, pull out all my lobby cameras, ta-da. 
quick and easy. So there's benefits as well to organizing them in a way that you can click and drag that whole group over because they're all right there. If I have an incident that comes up or whatever it might be, right? So if I am, if I'm just winging it, I'm on the fly, okay? Here's my blank nine camera view. We just had something happen in the lobby. Uh, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna drag all my cameras out to lobby, bam, I'm done and I'm looking at it. It's that quick, okay? Now hopefully, you've got pre-built views that you can just quickly say, I'm gonna jump to the lobby, and then it's there. But if you needed to, you, you can drag those folders out. Okay, um, the views that are also here on the left-hand side in my navigation pane, you can hide that pane, and I have a drop-down right next to it. And in my drop-down, look familiar, I have those same views. Here's my option one, here's my option two, here's my option three, Here's my expanded option three and so on. All right, now let's say I just want to look for a specific camera. Let's say I want to look for all my cameras that are PTZs. In my box up here, PTZ. Now, I can search for PTZ because it's in the name of my camera, okay? And look, here's my PTZs. There's seven of them that match. Here's the views that have PTZ cameras in them. I could pull up the view or I could pull up the specific camera. Let's look back at this 6315. And there I just jumped to a specific camera that I searched for. This camera does not exist in its own view anywhere in my system. But because I searched and selected it, it pulled it into its own one by one view, okay? We can do the same thing. We can hit show more. That will show us the rest of the options in the list. Um, it's even showing up on a map, so I could be like, well, where is this camera on my, oh, let's see, I needed to have clicked the map icon, and it's going to pull it up and show me where that camera is on the map. And it's one of those. It didn't jump straight to it, but it did take me to the map. Okay. All right. Um, if I wanted to just hit the view, so... We, we had a view called option three. Let's do option, and here's my option three. Bam, I can jump right to it. So those are some really quick and easy ways to move around from view to view. view, to view. Um, as we kind of touched on, if you are dealing with multiple monitors, um, you can right click on a view. Let's say I want option three on this monitor, and you won't be able to see it, but if I want option two on, uh, we'll do two exp three expanded on my other monitor. Right clicking on that view gives me the send view to menus, primary display. And I don't know if this will show on Teams, but there's a blue box that pops up around the outline of my screen. Okay, so you're like, well, I don't know which one's my primary. I don't know which one's my secondary one. I don't know which one's my secondary two. As you mouse over it, that box is gonna pop up and show you which screen it is that you are seeing. Okay, or you can always do floating window. Floating window is going to let me click and drag it around to wherever I want. Like we did before, we flung it to the side and we used our Windows uh, context um, to, to, to shortcut those out to the side. OK, um, so same function with multiple monitors. You can pull up different views, different monitors, put them all together. You can even link them together um, in terms of keeping one in playback or all of them in playback. So let's grab, let's see, we're looking at option three. Let's grab my option three expanded, send view two, floating window. Throw that one over there. We're gonna do this one over here, okay? Up here across the top, let's go to playback. Now you notice I just went to playback in one and my other one's still in live. So right now they're unlinked, okay? Let me go here, playback here, same thing. I can do live. All right, let's say I want to link them though. And let me find where that moved to link. OK, right here. Looks like a little padlock chain type icon. Link this window to the main window. OK, now it's linked. My playback and live icons now down here are grayed out. And watch what happens. Live, everything changes to live. Playback, everything changes to playback. So if you're dealing with a workstation that is four monitors spread across a wall, you can have them behave in linked or unlinked, or you could have just one screen linked and the others unlinked. You have that, that capability, that flexibility there. 
All right, now a word of caution on the views. We're gonna jump back a little bit here. When I go to new view, what's the most number of cameras I can put in a view? Based on what we're seeing here, a hundred. Uh, that's a lot of cameras in a view, okay? <laughs> let's just see how far I can get. Um, let's grab my all cameras group and we're gonna pull it out and we're gonna start to fill those in. Let's see what happens. It's gonna take a minute. Might crash my uh, smart client, hopefully not. And okay, like, okay guys, What's the point of looking at a hundred cameras when they're like the size of a of a of a nickel or a quarter? Even on a big screen like what we have up here, like you can't, it's not really usable. And and, and I know I have the overlay over it. I can turn that off. Uh, let's go to advanced and video not video diagnostic overlay. Okay, we'll turn that off. Okay, now we can actually kind of see it, right? But uh I, I mean are you really gonna catch something happening in that 100 view? No, you're not. Research has shown that basically we're able to kind of see, watch simultaneously, um, like it's roughly eight to 12 cameras. Maybe 16 if you're super high functioning. I'm like more in the four camera range, so uh, uh, it, it's a lot. Um, here's where this can really get you in trouble. I'm in playback mode right now. I'm not actually looking at any video. I'm not processing any video. If I were to switch to live or hit play, that's a ton of data that my computer's trying to pull in. Can it process that? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how your computer's built. Um, on a laptop, probably not. In fact, most laptops guaranteed not. If you have a $4,000, $5,000 workstation, that has uh, multiple high-end graphics cards, um, then then yes, you potentially could do that. Um, but a hundred on a single on a single view, not really. Um, most of the installs where where I'm involved in, I actually limit this to a most to a max of like twenty five. Uh, what that does is it's going to reduce the number of support calls we get saying, I, I did this, I added 100, and now I can't close it, I can't do anything, I can't take them out because my computer's all locked up and frozen. So I'm saving myself a little bit of headache by limiting it to 25 so that uh, somebody doesn't come in and, and try and do just exactly this. Um, so please, please, if you do have the option still in your system, don't do it. <laughs> um, Generally speaking, I mean, we're, we're talking averages here, right? Unless you have a workstation built for it. Um, eight is generally fine. 12 is generally fine. Some laptops you can even stretch into the realm of 16. But what's gonna happen is the more you pull in, the more your computer has to work to try and showcase that. And in order to, to, to make that actually happen, it's going to start dropping frames. And where if you were looking at eight cameras, you'd have nice, fluid, smooth playback. At 16, now you're gonna get a little choppy. When you get to 24, now it's gonna probably be almost near unusable. So if your computer's built for it, go for it. But if it's not, just know at some point you're gonna hit a limitation and that's gonna start to show as getting choppy and, and, and so on. And your computer will just start to feel sluggish. All right, um, we are coming up on the last half hour. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend 15 minutes looking at two more items. We're gonna look at bookmarks and we're going to kind of delve into search just a little bit because there's a lot we can do in search. Um, and then we're going to spend the last 15 minutes, we'll open that up to any questions. And we'll see how this moderates in terms of questions that are in the room versus online, but uh, we'll, we'll use that time to answer what we can. Okay, um, so bookmarks. Let's go to live. Let's pick a view. I like my option three. All right. Um, let's go to, we'll pull up a camera. All right, here's my camera. 
on my pop-up bar down here with all the different icons on it, okay? Um, there is one that looks like a little little hanging flag, like a little, it's, it's a bookmark icon. It says add bookmark. When I click on it, it added a bookmark. But what did it do? I don't know. Um, if I go back to my playback now, and I go to where we were, we were live, so it was at the end of my video. I'll zoom in on my timeline here. Um, it'll be a little bit easier to see once the rest of this fills red. But right here on my timeline is a little bookmark flag, that same little icon. When I mouse over it, I get a little pop up that shows me the video at the time of that bookmark and then a name and a description, who created the bookmark, when the bookmark was added, a lot of information. Now, we didn't enter all of that information. What we did is on live, live defaults to a quick bookmark. It just does it. We can set that to be um, uh, the full details bookmark. In playback, the default is add the full details. So let's come back to, um, let's find a car or a person here walking through our camera. There was one. Okay, there's a, uh, Mr. MMC contractors driving by. I'm going to add a bookmark now in playback. I click it. Now I get a pop up window that says add bookmarks. Um, I can adjust the reference image of the bookmark. My reference image might be like I, I like this one because it's it's very clear that there is that truck there. Here's my little reference image. It's this little center icon the center bar on my timeline and i can click and drag that okay i want that to be my reference image here's my start of the sequence we'll do it right before he pulls in right there with his shadow and then the end of the sequence we'll make that once he is fully out of scene right there there's my bookmark we can give it a name um mmc contractor and then we'll say uh suspicious vehicle driving by and now i'm not in any way saying that mmc contractors are suspicious i'm sure they're great okay just just as an example all right um and i can hit okay my bookmark is added you can see it there on the timeline all right now there's the benefit of being able to see it on the timeline, right? Oh yeah, that's that's where that was. I found it easy. But a bookmark is also a searchable thing. And so let's dig into search. We're gonna search this camera. And so I can quickly, there's a button here that says, go to camera on, oh, sorry, uh, next one over. Um, send the camera to a new search window. I click that and I have a new window that pops up, okay? I can also, there's a search tab on my main window. I can leverage that as well. We'll just do it here. All right, time frame. Let's do the last uh, seven days, okay, on this camera. I haven't told it what to search for, so it's it's not really giving me any results yet. It says, yep, I have a can. there's the camera. All right, what do we want to search for? I want to search for bookmarks. So I select bookmarks, I hit new search, okay. I have two results in the last seven days, two bookmarks in the last seven days. One of them was a quick bookmark. That was that first one. I can click it and I can resize my side window over here to make that bigger. OK, and here is my quick bookmark. Here is the MMC contractor bookmark I made. OK, you'll notice on my timeline, there's this little yellow line. That is that was that that middle. Uh, little indicator on the timeline that we dragged to make the reference image. So that was my reference image right there, okay? With my pre that I selected and the post that I selected all the way till he goes out of scene. I have the name I gave it, the camera it came from, a bookmark ID, the event time of the bookmark, the start time of the sequence, end time of the sequence, who added it, the description and the headline. So it's all there. Now, if it's mapped, Here's where that bookmark happened, right here on this camera, okay? I can now, if I want, I can review that. I can 
click this other button here next to my play, which is use the selected time on the playback timeline. What that does, doesn't look like it did anything, but it put me in playback mode and it put me at that timestamp on my main window. Okay, and let's pull this guy back up. All right, so if I wanted to search for everything, let's say I can't remember what camera it was. Um, I'm gonna come and select my all cameras and we're still searching for bookmarks. Uh, and we're going to do a custom interval. Let's say, let's search for bookmarks in the last, uh, we'll do since the beginning of December and we'll hit set. Okay, still only two. I know I've got other bookmarks in here. I think they're probably just a little further back. So let's go back to as far as I can go. There we go, we've got some others. Hey, look, another training session doing bookmarks. <laughs> um, I bookmarked the garbage truck coming a couple different times. so. It's a really easy way. I can search for keywords, so we can just search for garbage. And now I get the only, only bookmarks that match a keyword garbage, all right? So you can kind of start to see how that can be useful. All right, what else can I search for? Let's clear out our search list and let's add in a, let's grab a warehouse camera. So I'm gonna go to all cameras and warehouse. And we're going to do warehouse long wall racks. Let's see if that's the one that I want. I believe it is. And we're going to search for, let's um, also just do the last 24 hours. 141 results on this hits, you know, in this camera in, in, uh, in the last 24 hours. Okay, I want to search for motion. I'm looking, I want to look in a particular portion of my image and find motion inside that portion of the, Im of the image. So. Motion, new search. So these are 181 different motion results across that whole camera in the last 24 hours. All right, well, let's define the area. So you'll see there's a specify motion area drop down. Okay, let's look for motion that happened over here towards my cabling. Uh, and let's trim out the floor a little bit because I don't want vehicles or shadows to maybe hit that. All right, and we'll hit the X. So from here, let me make my thumbnail size a little bigger. Here's a hit. All right, we got, um, you'll, you saw it really quick there. The bounding boxes pop up right there. That's shadows, that's a uh, little bit of, you know, the, uh, the sticker dots here kind of blowing in the wind. Okay, all right, so we had some motion. We'll do the next one, same, next one, same. Next one, same. All right, we're getting a lot of results that aren't quite what we want. Well, if we do keep going, oh, hey, here's one. Now we got a uh, motion over in that area. Okay, so we can get some useful results. Doing motion-based search, it's great if you kind of have an isolated area, right? Not a lot's gonna happen in that area. Let's change our result here. So let's, let's reset our selection. Let's look up here. Do we have any motion up here kind of on the top rack over here? Let's see. Got a little bit, yeah. So got this one here. All right, I think that was the camera doing a quick focus. We have this one here where the lights are turning off. Okay, lights changing is detected as motion. Lights turning on, um, scrolling through these results. Yeah, I'm not seeing like anything with people in that area. So not so great, but we do get results, okay? All right, let's, let's change this up a little bit. We're gonna search for something different. How about instead of searching for motion, and I'm gonna pick a different camera, let's go to the, uh, let's do my exterior front door sidewalk. Okay, we're gonna do that same search here. Let's search for motion, same 24 hour period, new search. 781 results and look how fast that was that was really quick okay let's say i want to filter that down to an area all right let's just look for motion that happens right here at the front door okay okay 11 12 it's still counting 22 24 results significantly better than 181 okay but what do we got Nothing. Oh, here we go. Okay. 
person. Bounding box, yep, that's a valid result. That's a valid one. And then you can kind of just look through them and see. This one's probably not going to be useful. Nope. Okay, here we go. We got people. Okay, we got more. Oh, that's a bird. You know, <laughs> not, not real useful. Um, yes, you can set your motion threshold thresholds sensitive enough to catch birds and mice and things running around your warehouse. Um, you know, we're in Vegas, so we got a lot of pigeons. We got a pigeon there. Okay, uh, more people. Let's let's get a little more intelligent here with this, though. I don't want to search for motion. I only want people. Search for people. See what we get in the last 24 hours. Okay, now I'm going to caveat this. What we're searching is metadata. If the, if the information is not in the metadata, we can't search this. What puts that information in the metadata? The camera. And not every camera is capable of doing this. So what this takes, for Han, or sorry, for, for Axis, it takes a camera with Axis object analytics. For Hanwha, it takes a camera with AI analytics. Okay, those are the two brands, those are the, the marketing names that those two companies use. There's others for other brands. That's mainly what we deal with. Um, for an Axis AOA object analytics camera, that um, requires uh, some ArtPEC 7 chipsets and any ArtPEC 8 chipset. So any camera new, new camera model, uh, essentially within the last year, give or take. All right. And then it has to be configured on the camera. And then you have to make sure that your metadata channel in Milestone is enabled. And then you can get this data in the Milestone to make it searchable. So let's see what we have. We might still get some false alerts here, but it certainly is better than the 181 or so that we are looking at. OK, let's see. Let's, OK, there's a person. And it did, there's the bounding box. It did detect it as a person. Here's a person. OK. Um, Axis has their own plugin that takes this kind of to the next level. And it's going to be this forensic search. So let's do a new forensic search. And I want to search for humans. Let's see what we get. Some of these are not fully set up across all of my cameras, so I might have selected a bad camera for demonstration purposes. Let's clear the list and just for simplicity, say all cameras. Find all humans across my system. OK, it's searching. Here we've got multiple results. And here we go. So we are detecting people. Sorry, table here on the left. You get to be shown in a lot of results. But you notice we're not getting a lot of false alerts. Now, we do have this random one. What's happening here? Well, the radar out back of the building here detected a human walking. And there you go. It just classified it as human. And that showed up in our search because it's a metadata. It's information coming from our edge point device into my milestone, and it just searches for the human element. I see some blown minds. Radar's really cool. It's actually one of my favorite things. Um, and we'll go into radar at a really fun opportunity. Okay, let's let's get rid of human. I don't want I don't I don't care about people anymore. Just show me vehicles, okay? So, all right. Now some of these. Here it is, way out here on the road across the parking lot. There's the vehicle. We'll come back and play. OK, there it is. That's a one frame per second at that moment in time. Here's my radar. OK, and here it comes right there. We haven't gotten the classification yet. The bounding box might be covering it up. But it should pop up here and say vehicle. All right, we missed on that one. There you go, more cards. I need to limit this one so we're not doing this detection out on the road because there's a lot of cards that drive through there. But so you can kind of see how we can make our video more useful. Statistically, 
Um, Andy, do you remember what it is? Like um, Tiger was telling us their research the other day on how often, how much, what percentage of video, recorded video is actually viewed at a later date? Less than 1%, yeah. My gut says it's one to five. Some might be more up in the five, some might be in the one. So typically that's just because there's so much data there and it's not, hasn't historically been super usable except for, well, I'm just going to search and scrub through. Oh, okay, well, there, that was interesting, but the rest of it's useless, right? Um, the metadata that can come in from a camera into your milestone allows us to make the system more usable. And I'll talk through a situation, a scenario where that highlights this. If you have a, a building, and the areas, the grounds, the property surrounding your building are supposed to be vacated at night. Nobody should be in there, okay? You have a camera or a series of cameras that are watching using, for example, access object analytics on a person detection or vehicle detection. So we can automatically eliminate Cats, birds, and dust and garbage blowing through, lights turning on and off, and a whole bunch of other things that would give us false alerts. When we scope that to humans and vehicles, now a person walking through that camera scene, that information comes into milestone, and I can now say, hey, based on this detection and classification of this is a person in this area, tie it to a time period, let's say after hours, now I can notify or push an alert, send an email, or throw something up on a smart wall. Or if I have a siren um, up above me on the Camdelier, we have an Axis D4100. For those of you joining in online, just uh, Google it. So it's an Axis D4100. It is a siren strobe. We can now have Milestone turn on that siren and start flashing that strobe. And now my person's taken off running because they're a little scared. That's a really useful scenario. Now, we could have done that before Axis Object Analytics or before this classification capabilities, but the challenge was that garbage, that, that, that garbage bag blowing through the wind, that would have done it. That cat walking through the scene, that potentially would have done it. So when we scope it to the intelligence of the camera, now the camera is saying, this is a person. There's a high likelihood, at least, that this is a person. We, we automatically reduce our false alerts. All right, I've rambled on enough. Um, let's, let's turn to some questions real quick. Let me browse and see if we have any here in the chat. Yeah, Adam, we've got one, one question um, in the chat that we need to respond to. Um, yes. The question is, how do I consolidate camera views from multiple milestone servers um, into a one-stop shop rather than having to log into every individual server. Um, and does that require special licensing? Maybe if you could okay. just address that. That's a great question. So if I'm understanding the scenario correctly, you have, and, and we'll, we'll simplify it with the use case, um, you have a facility over in Salt Lake City, Utah. You have another facility over in Denver and another facility over in, uh, we'll say Las Vegas, standing a little bit like stone. Um, in all those locations. At each of those facilities, you have a independent milestone system running. How do I connect those together so that I can see the cameras without having to log in to each site specifically? Well, there's a couple ways. Some of it depends on system architecture. Some of it depends on licensing. Um, you could Potentially, again, there's 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 system design caveats that would require further conversation around this and what would be best for your situation. But here's the options at a high level. You could consolidate down to one management server, okay? And then recording servers at the individual locations. Now I'm only logging into one location. And from that location, I can access and view cameras from all of my locations. There's some drawbacks to that. There's some network dependencies required for that, okay? Um, but that's one scenario. Here's another one. Let's say I want to make sure that my Salt Lake location and my Denver location are completely independent from one another and able 
in such a way that if that network connection between those two sites drops, I still want both sites to be able to be up and running and functional. Um, we can use milestone licensing through two different methods. There's uh, milestone interconnect, which would let us take a selection or all cameras from one site and port them over to the other site, which then lets me have all of my cameras from whichever connected sites in one system to view. Um, I can also leverage Milestone uh, XProtect corporate licensing to use a feature called Federation. And Federation is basically, here's my, uh, my parent site, my headquarters, okay? With my Milestone system independent to my headquarters. Beneath that as a child, I now have my, uh, my Denver location. And then I also have my California location and I have my other locations. Those are each independent child sites and I can create a federated architecture between them that creates the links. From my child site, I can only see my child cameras and devices, okay? What's local to that site. But from my parent site, you can now see your parent site cameras and everything below in your federated site cameras. Now, there are some complexities that make one situation better than another. So that is something that we would definitely want to follow up with on a, a conversation specific to your use case and your, your, your architecture to, to help you pick the right one. What else do we have? Any others? There was one here in the Q&A section that uh, says, is the private view data stored locally? If so, where can it be transferred to a new computer? Um, your view data is actually stored on the management server in the SQL database. So if you're on your laptop and you create a private view and then you go to your desktop and you log in with that same user, all your private views will be accessible there as well. So none of the smart client stuff is specific to this computer only. It's all tied to your user, regardless of where you're logging in. As long as you're logging in as you, or that at least a, a consistent user between the different locations, then, then your experience there will be the same. Um, any others? Let's see. Any from the room that we can answer? Yeah, Adam, there's nothing left online, so take any from the room. And if anybody online wants to pop in and, and chat in or use the Q&A, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. If you have a question, type it in the text and, uh, and we'll get to it there as well. And if we run out of time, then we'll, we'll loop back to you after. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and OK, so the question was the, the F5 key that we set up as a shortcut to reload the configuration. Um, the use case for that, um, and is it is it the only thing needed? So, so what that does is when you log into Milestone, when you log into a smart client, the smart client is reaching out to the management server and saying, give me the configuration of everything that I have permissions to. It's pulling that configuration now local to your smart client. Um, if that configuration changes on the management server, we're now running out of sync, okay? Not a problem, you can run out of sync. What happens though is now I want to actually use that new change, right? Um, so that F5, F5 will refresh that configuration, pull it back local to my computer, and now I'm good to keep going because now I have that updated. Now I am in sync again. It's not typically an everyday thing for people. Where this becomes useful is if there's you're actively growing your system. Like, you know, you have your milestone open and you've been using cameras all morning, but your IT department just said, hey, we just got five more cameras added in. You should see them. You're looking at it going, I don't see them. Just hit F5, refresh, and then you should see them. If you at that point you then still don't see them, then you got to go talk back and say, hey, I, I'm still not seeing them. Can you check that the permissions are set correctly? Because there's probably something they missed there. Um, but once your system is kind of like done and set and static and you're not really, nothing's really changing, the F5 doesn't really become that useful anymore because it's not, there's no configuration to refresh. You're, you're already running the right version. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why that configuration pulls local instead of staying on the management server. Um, we have my milestone pulled open right now. 
and I'm logged in and I'm able to view cameras. If my management server, if I were to lose communication to my management server, I can still stay up and running for at least a limited amount of time. There is a security token that is happening in the background between all of the smart clients and all of the rest of the milestone components. And the, the management server is the central holder of those tokens and the manager of those tokens. So by default, once an hour, my smart client is checking in with the management client and getting a new token, all right? If it's unable to refresh that token, my session is going to expire and I won't be able to use the cameras anymore. That token, that, that threshold is variable. We can specify what that is. For example, for some customers that um, require, like they want a system to be up and running even if their management server is down for an, expended, uh, an extended period of time. Um, airports, for example, um, that one hour is, is not really a good option for them because if that management server goes offline for more than an hour, and and you know and they're working on it they're working the problem then they start dropping clients all over the place and now we have a bigger problem so we might set that to a few days or a week or really i mean it's it's customizable i, I haven't ever gone to an extreme of like a month I, I don't think that would be good um but there's a trade off here's the trade off let's say i set it to a week okay and i have an employee joe and I give Joe permissions to view cameras and he's got his laptop and he's got his cameras open and or his desktop and he's so he's sitting in his office watching cameras. Um, and I get a call from HR that says, take away Joe's camera permissions immediately. Okay. I jump into my management client. I disable his user. Guess what happens? His permissions stay active until his token refreshes which if it's set to a week, at the longest could be another week. So there are trade-offs to that. There's a balance between how long I want my users to be able to stay in and running versus how long I want my users to be able to stay in and running, okay? So, um, but the one hour for most people is, is more than sufficient, um, that default, but uh, it's not uncommon to change it to maybe two hours or three hours or four hours or a day, 24 hours. Um, but but yeah, that's that's what's going on there. Um, we have another question. There's two there's two chats, Adam. If you want to go to the one from Mike. Yes, Mike. So Mike says, how do how does device changes without activation work in an offline environment? Are you limited to how many changes you can make per year? OK, so if I'm understanding you correctly, Mike, what you're saying is how device changes like adding cameras, taking away cameras, things like that. Um, are there limitations to what I can do if my system is not able to uh, authenticate against the milestone licensing server? And, and here's the answer to that. Um, yes and no, there are limits. So um, the limits are based on the size of your system, okay? Uh, so if you're looking at my licensing page right here, okay, device licenses, I have 51 activated, changes without activation, zero out of 10. So I can make up to 10 changes. I could add 10 cameras before it's going to say, nope, you can't do anything else. You have to activate now. So there is some leeway there, okay? And then you have devices running in grace period. Grace period is 30 days. And then you have devices that are past and expired their grace period. And then you have devices running without a license. Devices running without a, devices running without a license are disabled in the system. You can't use them. Um, so how many that is though? Like mine shows 10. If you have 1,000 cameras, it might show 20. If you have 5,000 cameras, it might show 150, right? Um, but that's based on your system size. Um, offline systems, they do create that challenge though of activating that license. Um, and there is a process, you just have to go through and do an offline, export the license, take that over to a machine that has internet access and then upload it. Uh, I mean, well, typically you're gonna send it to Stone Security um, and then we will upload it to the portal uh, and then send you back 
a updated license with those changes that you made and then you come in you have to import that so it does take a minute but uh that's a great question second question since the configuration changes such as the f5 mapping have been have to be created on a local pc is there a configuration file that can be exported imported to make uh that and other changes more accessible okay um we uh, are short on time short answer to that um matthew is um I need to do some research. I don't believe there's a local configuration, but those are tied to the user anyway um, and not the local configuration. But we'll add that as a follow up and we'll get back to you uh, with a little bit more uh, detail on that. So we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining us and attending. Um, again, look for that email um, for that survey. We'd love to hear back from you on what your thoughts were, on what we can do better, on what can be done different. Yes, yes. Okay, if you're joining online, and just for general information, we have about 25 people currently online. I know we lost a few uh, over the last 10 minutes. Um, it is so beneficial for you to get to one of our stone offices. If you're not in an area where that's possible, we understand. But here's why. When you are at that stone office, we have sales uh, account managers and we have engineers there available to answer and address your further questions. On top of that, there's food. And who doesn't love free food? Uh, it's, it's, it's called security and sandwiches for a reason. So come have some sandwiches. If you want to come and you have some dietary restrictions, communicate that to us and we will make adaptations to, to ensure that we get you some food as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time today. Uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. Check out our website. Um, you can hit us at uh, um, your your account rep or um, any of the other contacts that you have for us. And um, Patrick dropped another link and it's, uh, an email in the chat. Check there. We'll post this on YouTube as soon as we're able to. We might uh, have to tweak a few things, but uh, thank you. And we will see you next month. And end.